Well, good morning. good morning. Welcome to Grace Valley Christian Center's Adult Sunday School. In John chapter 13, we read Jesus speaking to the disciples, to his apostles at the Last Supper, and he says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the church is to be the body of Christ, and we are to be a light shining forth into this dark world. And I pray that as we finish considering this topic of sanctification, that you would build each of us up in our most holy faith, that together, as the church, as the body of Christ, we would properly represent you in this world, that people would see Christ in us, and that you would use us to draw others to this glorious saving grace that is available in Christ. And so we ask your blessing on this time. In Jesus. We're going to consider, going to finish today sanctification. We're looking again at Murray's order of the events and the application of redemption here, and we've covered effectual calling, which is God's calling us into fellowship with his son, and regeneration, wherein God enables us to respond to this call by giving us a new heart. We've looked at our response to this call and new birth, which is faith and repentance. We've looked at justification, which is God's legal declaration that we are just grounded on the righteousness of Christ imputed to us by faith. That is the ground but we're considering sanctification, which is a real working in us of righteousness as well. And we've also covered adoption, which is God's legal act to make us members of his family. And we're halfway through sanctification. <laughs> God working in us to transform us to be more like Jesus Christ. So we have discussed the fact that in the order of application of redemption, calling and regeneration are the functional antecedents of sanctification. That is, they provide the foundation for sanctification because it is in our union with Christ and our being changed by new birth that we have the power to overcome sin in our lives and to be sanctified. And we discussed the fact that definitive sanctification can be spoken of, and there's a significant sense in which we have been sanctified if we have been born again. And that is a done and a finished thing. But there's also a very real need for progressive sanctification. We must work daily to put off the old and to put on the new. This is not something that is an accomplished task and there's nothing left to be done. In one sense it is accomplished, but there's a great deal left to be done. And some of us maybe more than others. But So Murray's speaking about progressive sanctification. We've talked about the, the goal of sanctification having two parts. The first goal was the glory of God. And we're halfway through or partway through the second goal, which is our glory. And in dealing with our glory, the secondary goal here, Murray, we've already talked about sin as a contradiction of God's holiness, Murray's first point. And we've already talked about the fact that sin produces conflict in the inner being of a true Christian. And now we're ready to talk about the fact that the remaining sin that is in us is not reigning sin. And so Paul uses a simple but very profound logic to make the point that although a Christian still has a sinful nature, this sinful nature should not rule in us. And he bases his imperatives, which are the commands that he gives to us, on indicatives, which are statements of fact. And we're going to look at Romans 6, but this is true of virtually all of Paul's epistles. He makes indicative statements, and then he makes imperatives based on those indicatives. And if you start looking for that, it helps in reading it, because he gives us the logic behind what he's saying. He's saying, you need to do these things, but just before he tells you you need to do these things, he usually gives you the reasons why you're able to do those things and why you need to. So let's examine his arguments in Romans 6. In verses 2 through 4, we read, We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were, therefore, buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Now, notice here the absolutely radical, unequivocal metaphors that he uses here. We died. We were buried. Those are the indicatives. And you know, you may stop sometimes and say to yourself, well, wait a minute, but I don't feel dead to sin. There's still sin in me. But we need to stop and think about that because 
It is true that there's still sin in me, but it's also a true statement that I am dead to sin. I can never, as a Christian, say that I couldn't help myself, that I couldn't stop from sinning, that there was some temptation that was too great. If you're a Christian, you cannot say those things because if you say them, you're lying. It's as simple as that. We're told in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that no temptation has seized you except that which is common to man. And God is faithful. He will never let you be tempted beyond what you, can prepare, what you can bear, but he will present a way out. And you have the power if you are born again. So every single solitary time you sin, it was not necessary. So in a very real sense, we are dead to sin. Now with that said, we all know our reality is that we do sin. But that's our problem. That's our fault. We should be dead to sin. That's not some sort of a parabolic statement that is not meant to be taken literally. We are dead to sin. It's not a contradiction with the fact that we do still sin, though. So he comes up with some imperatives based on these indicatives. So we note the purpose, that we may live a new life. And there's sort of the first imperative. And then we go on here, Romans 12 and 6, uh, 12 through 13. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. So note our responsibility. We must live this new life, which means two things. First, we don't let sin reign. Yes, it's there but you have the power to say no. You can defeat it. And secondly, we must do something positive. We must serve God with every ability that he has given us. And so it's a true statement that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and not by works. But it is also true that if we are truly saved, we will have good works. And just two simple verses here from Matthew 7 and Matthew 12, our, our Lord is speaking and he says, every good tree bears good, truth, good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. A pretty simple statement. And in fact, how would you define a good fruit tree? Well, because it bears good fruit, right? And then he goes on and he says, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. It's a simple statement. So we can recognize in ourselves and in others whether or not there is the fruit of new birth. Now we have to be careful with that because we can be deceived. People can do outwardly things that look good. They can be a part of the church. They can act very spiritual. They can do all kinds of things and not truly be born again because we can't see into the heart. But with ourselves... We still have to be careful, even though you would think we should know our own heart, but what does Jeremiah tell us? The heart is desperately wicked and deceitful. Who can know it? So we have to be careful even in judging ourselves. We have to look at our motives, as we'll see later, and be very careful with that. There are many verses we could use to show that good works are necessary as proof of our having been born again. I'm only going to show some, but there are many we could pull out. If you read the New Testament with this idea in mind and start marking the verses that say this, you will find it is just absolutely scattered throughout the entire New Testament. The idea that you can live a Christian life without obedience is simply a lie. It's not possible. So we're told in Ephesians 2.10, which is right after the passages that says you've been saved by grace through faith, and this is a gift, not of yourselves, and all that, right? And then what does it say? We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. And in Matthew 28, in the Great Commission, Christ said, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them, what? To obey everything I have commanded you. And Jesus also said in John 14, If you love me, you will obey what I command. Is that not as clear as he could possibly have made it? I can't imagine how Christ could have worded that any more clearly, could he? If you love me, you will obey me. It will follow automatically. And he goes on, just in case we're slow, which we are. And he says, whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father. And think about the opposite of that. He who does not love me will not be loved by my Father. And who doesn't love him? The one who doesn't obey him. But he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. 
And in Romans chapter 2 in the ESV, it read, tells us that God will render to each one according to his works. And I use the ESV there because that's the word in the Greek, works. So when, you're, when people want to say in the modern church, you know, works have no part in our salvation, they're just wrong. Now, of course, there's a sense in which they're right, as we talked about earlier. The ground of our salvation is Christ and his righteousness, his works. But my works must be there or my statement that I'm a Christian is a lie. It's as simple as that. Pastor Matthew commented on this verse in Romans, in his commentary on Romans, and he wrote, either we produce good works, evidencing our justification by faith, or we produce dead works, demonstrating our unbelief, stubbornness, unrepentance, and enmity against God. And I like that statement a lot because it very succinctly makes three important points. First, it points out that, you know, our works are not the basis for our justification. What does he say? Either we produce good works evidencing our justification by faith. They are proving the fact that we have, in fact, been born again. The second point it makes is that everybody has works. You can't live and not have works. We might say some people look like they're not doing anything, but, but in the biblical sense, everybody has works. And the third point is that there's only two possibilities for those works. Either your works are evidencing the fact that you were born again, or your works are evidencing the fact that you're destined for hell. You have nothing to do with Jesus Christ. There is no third option. There is no person who has been born again, but they're a carnal Christian, and they don't really have any good works because they haven't really come to that place yet of declaring Christ to be their Lord. He's just their Savior. No. No such, no such third option exists. And we can also go on. We'll just list a couple more ones here. 1 John 2, 3 through 6. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. Again, could he have possibly put it more clearly? The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. And how did Jesus walk? He always did the will of his heavenly Father in perfect obedience. And then in Revelation 19, we read in verses 7 and 8, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride, which is the church, of course, has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. And if I just stop there, what would many Christians who have some theological knowledge say today? Well, that linen, that, that, that bright clothing that we're given, that's the righteousness of Christ because we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And there's certainly a sense in which that's true. I am clothed in the righteousness of Christ, and it's his righteousness that is the ground of my salvation. But what does it say here? It says, fine linen stands for the righteous acts of the saints. This is not talking about the imputed righteousness of Christ. This is talking about my righteousness. Imperfect, well, it, it will always be in this life, but it must be there. And proper Christian obedience, however, is not rendered for the purpose of gaining a reward. Now, the Bible certainly holds out to us a reward for our obedience. So it's given to us as, as, as motivational tool, essentially. But if that is the sole motive, if any obedience I'm rendering is solely because I'm afraid of going to hell and I want to go to heaven, which is a good thing. I should be afraid of going to hell and I should want to go to heaven. But if that's the sole purpose for my obedience, then I'm doing it in my own strength to gain something for me. I'm not born again. The obedience must be done from a motive of love of God. Jesus said, as we've already seen, if you love me, you will obey what I command. And in Matthew 22, 36 to 40, when he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? How did our Lord reply? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And those two commandments hang on one word, don't they? Love but a proper biblical definition of love. Giving of ourselves for the good of someone else, not expecting something in return. That's what it takes. And if we aren't obeying out of that motive, then we aren't obeying truly in the sense that the Bible is speaking about it. And second, we must obey to please and glorify God, to honor Christ and to advance his kingdom and benefit our neighbor. And I won't go through them, but you can go home and examine as just examples, Galatians 1.10, Colossians 1.10, 1 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. And we're going to look at Ephesians 4 later, but verses 1 through 3 and 11 through 16. 
And Ephesians 4, 1, we'll show here is, as a prisoner for the Lord then, this is Paul writing, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. We have been given this marvelous calling, and we should try to live a life worthy of that calling, which glorifies God and honors Christ and advances his kingdom. And then thirdly, we must obey God's standard, not man's standard, not my pathetic standard. We must obey God's standard. As we already saw again in the Great Commission, what did Christ say? Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. It is the commands given to us by God. And those are very, very strict and very severe commandments. You know, Christ didn't abrogate the Ten Commandments in the moral law. He emphasized them, didn't he? Because he said, if you look at a woman lustfully in your heart, you've committed adultery. Well, that's a much tougher standard than just saying, if I actually go commit the act of adultery, isn't it? So we all stand condemned when we understand the commandments in their proper and full impact. And many professing Christians reject this idea that the law of God has any role to play in their lives. They think law-keeping is strictly an Old Testament idea. But Christ himself, as I just said, extended the moral law rather than abolishing it. And there's a wonderful book by a Puritan named Sam Bolton called The True Bounds of Christian Freedom. And in there he wrote, the law sends us to the gospel for our justification. The gospel sends us to the law to frame our way of life. And earlier we talked about the three uses of the law. This gives two of them, doesn't it? The law sends us to the gospel for our justification. It's the pedagogical use, it's called, of the law. It shows me my need for salvation, my need for Christ. And then we see the gospel sends us to the law to frame our way of life. Well, that's the normative use or the moral use of the law. It shows a Christian what God wants, how God wants us to live. It's an expression of God's character, how he wants us to live. And now you're all wondering what's the third use that you can't remember, right? That's the civil use of the law, right? To restrain evil by the threat of punishment. So we've talked about the fact that sin is a contradiction of God's holiness and sin produces conflict in the inner being of a true Christian and that remaining sin is not reigning sin. And now we want to add this fourth point that was not in Redemption Accomplished and Applied but comes from Murray's later writings. And it's an extremely important point, which is why I'm adding it in, and we're going to spend some time on it. It is the communal or corporate nature of sanctification. So let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 16. And we'll read them first and then make a couple of comments and look at this. It was he, Christ, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. Why? to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. It's a wonderful passage. There's a lot we could say. We're just going to make two major points out of this. First, notice that the lofty goal we are to, go, we are to strive for, we are to attain to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So we have to ask ourselves, what on earth does that mean? What is the fullness of Christ, and what does it mean to attain to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ? We'll look at that briefly. And then the second thing is the communal aspect. We do not do this as individuals. You know, up at the top here, it talks about the fact that we're given pastors and teachers and evangelists and so forth. And then down here, it says, notice, we, the plural, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head. From him, the whole body, again, speaking of all of us, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself. This is the body now, not individual. Builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So we see this. We don't do this as individuals. Our sanctification is not an individual program. We do it as parts of the body of Christ, and each part must do its work. So what does the fullness of Christ mean? Well, Murray notes that this expression concerns not only the goal of the sanctifying process, it is also germane to the process itself. In other words, it also has something to say about the process. And so it's important to understand what this means. 
And after a lengthy discussion to go through all of the background for this, which we're not going to take the time for, but you can look at in his book if you'd like, he says that the church is the fullness of Christ. He's British, or, or he came from Scotland, so he misspelled fullness. But the, the church is the fullness of Christ. Why does he say the church is the fullness of Christ? Well, because to the church as the body of Christ is being imparted the fullness that is in Christ. The church is the recipient of that fullness of righteousness, wisdom, knowledge, power, grace, goodness, patience, love, truth, and mercy. And I'm sure he could have gone on with a few more, probably. But that is the fullness of Christ. It is all that Christ is imparting to the church. So the church, in a sense, is the fullness of Christ. And we, functioning together as the body of Christ, as a church, not as individuals, are to attain to the whole measure of this fullness of Christ. That's an amazing thing when you stop and think about it. But look at the words he uses there. This idea of righteousness, wisdom, knowledge, power, grace, goodness, patience, love, truth, and mercy. Most of those things involve relationships. Most of those things involve being together as a body. I can't have love by myself. Well, I guess I could, but not the kind of love I should have, right? We all love ourselves, I think. But, but love, in its true meaning, is, is outward-oriented. It's oriented towards somebody else. I can't have that as an individual. So sanctification is not a private enterprise. It's not something we do individually, or only individually. So Murray notes that this progression, which is a growth in knowledge and love, has respect not only to the individual, but also to the church in its unity and solidarity as the body of Christ. In reality, the growth of the individual does not take place except in the fellowship of the church as the fellowship of the spirit, Believers have never existed as independent units. That's an important statement. And sanctification itself is a process that moves to a consummation which will not be realized for the individual until the whole body of Christ is complete and presented in its totality, faultless and without blemish. What a wonderful statement. Murray also notes that if an individual is indifferent to the sanctification of others, and does not seek to promote their growth in grace, love, faith, knowledge, obedience, and holiness, it interferes with that person's own sanctification in at least two ways. First, his lack of concern for the other is itself a sin that gnaws at the root of spiritual growth, Murray says. If I'm not concerned at all about how my brothers and sisters are doing walking in Christ, I have a serious problem. Maybe my brothers and sisters do too, but I have a serious problem if I'm not concerned about them. If I can just watch them going off and straying and doing all sorts of things that they ought not to do as Christians, and if I can just say, well, okay, I don't know why he's doing that, but I'm going to keep walking the right way myself. I'm not walking the right way. There's something wrong. And secondly, my indifference to the interests of others means that I don't minister to that other person as I should. And because I haven't ministered to them as I should, they are impoverished in some way, and they can't minister to me as they should. And so now I become impoverished. You need me, and I need you. Because there are things you do that I don't do well. There may be things that I do well that you don't do well. There's All of us have a role to play, and we can't just say that somebody's not needed. And so we can't not be concerned about the sanctification of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And this communal aspect cannot be accomplished without commitment and involvement. Many modern Christians want to watch sermons on the internet or bounce around to different churches and not be answerable to anyone. But that is a clear violation of biblical principles. We must be members of a local body in vital connection with one another with accountability and responsibility. And it's a serious commitment, which we cannot unilaterally break f f without very serious cause and due diligence. I can't just walk down the street to a different family because I don't like what's being served for dinner in my house. And you can't just walk out of a church for any reason you want to walk out of a church. If I have a problem with somebody, the church tells me how to deal with that problem, doesn't it? The word tells me, go talk to the person. If that doesn't work, take a couple of brothers to go talk to the person. If that doesn't work, go to the elders. And if there's a problem in the church, if the church itself is doing something wrong, go to the elders and talk to the elders and work it out with the Bible. There's due diligence that must be done. Now, I'm not going to say there's never a time when somebody should leave a church. Okay, if your church becomes apostate and starts teaching heresy and you've talked with everybody and nothing will change, fine, you have to leave that church. That's an extremely rare event. Can we not agree? I mean, that, that's like almost never happens. Unfortunately, in this world it does, but it's not a common event for a church that's really preaching the gospel. And so 
what it says is we can't just leave willy-nilly. This is like a marriage. You can't just pick up and walk out because we're invested in each other. If we're doing what we ought to be doing, I care about you and your sanctification. You're to care about me and my sanctification. If I just pick up tomorrow because somebody offends me and go walking out the door and walk to some other church, I've harmed you. I've hurt you and I've hurt the body. That's not right. That's not acting as a Christian ought to act. This is a serious commitment. So don't forsake meeting together. Fellowship in the local church of which we are a member is necessary for a proper Christian life. In Hebrews chapter 10, we read, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. And, you know, to spur somebody on is not a metaphor that's speaking about a painless process, is it? Have you ever seen a spur? Uh, (laughs) Um, Spurring somebody on is, is not a pleasant thing. And then in Acts 2.42, we read about the the disciples, and we we see that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. This is an essential part of Christian living. We must work together so that we can all reach unity, we read, together as a part of the body of Christ. Remember, we read that Christ gave some to be apostles and so on, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and so on. It's not that we're in some big race and if I manage to beat you all out and get up the wall first, I win. No, we're all supposed to be trying to get everybody up that wall, the whole body of Christ. And Christians must be members of a local church with clear membership and authority. Or, for example, the following verses from Hebrews 13 make no sense. It says, remember your leaders. Well, you have to have a leader, don't you? Who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Now, that puts a huge responsibility on the leaders, doesn't it? And then obey your leaders and submit to their authority. We don't like that word in America. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. It harms me when I don't submit to proper biblical authority. It doesn't harm the authority over me. It probably does, actually. They, they grieve, but, but it harms me, first and foremost. And this whole, these, ver- these aren't the only ones I could use, but these verses make no sense if there isn't a membership and if there isn't accountability, and there isn't authority in the church. They just make no sense at all. And we also read in 1 Corinthians 5 about the man who was living with his uh, father's wife. Shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief, Paul tells the congregation, and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this? When you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan, so that the sinful nature may be destroyed, and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. In the Greek it actually says so that the flesh may be destroyed. So the most severe church discipline is to put someone out of the church. And again, that makes no sense if we're not members of a church with real membership and held accountable, and the church has authority. Otherwise it makes no sense to talk about putting somebody out. All right, we're ready to talk about the other elements here. In talking about sanctification, Murray talked about the goal, and we've covered that now. So we're ready to talk about the agent of sanctification. And although we are certainly active in our sanctification, as we've been arguing, we do not sanctify ourselves at the end of the day. Paul wrote to the church in Philippi that he was confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So it's God working, not just us. We do have to work, but it's God ultimately that is the one who guarantees I will be sanctified. Praise God for that, because I'm not so reliable for something that important. So praise God. It's him that I know will complete what he has begun. And we also read in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. Clearly speaking about progressive sanctification, not definitive, because he's saying, may he do it, you know, keep doing it. So present tense, continues. And specifically, we can say it's the Holy Spirit who sanctifies. If we look in Romans 8, 13 to 14, it says, if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And we've spoken about this before, a defining characteristic of a true Christian is that I'm being led by the Spirit of God. 
If that's true, I am a child of God. Now there's going to be conflict within me and all of this as we've talked about, but ultimately there is a leading of the Spirit of God. There's that little inner witness, that little inner word that comes in, and you know, even non-Christians have this to a degree because they go against their conscience at times, but it's much more powerful than that. You have something in there that grabs a hold of you, a resident boss, the Holy Spirit has been called, who grabs a hold of you and says, don't go that way. Go this way, not that way, this way. Not necessarily with words, but you know, shows you the way you should go. And in 2 Corinthians 3.18, in the King James, it reads, But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And I put up the King James instead of the NIV or ESV because they word it in a way that's not as clear that it's the action of the Spirit. But Murray goes through a fairly lengthy argument to show that the translation in either case still means that it's the Spirit who's doing this. So Murray again makes three points with regard to sanctification. He likes three points here. The mode of operation of the Holy Spirit is mysterious. You can go read John 3, 8. That's the wind blows where it wills. And we are completely dependent on the Holy Spirit. You can go home and look at Romans 8, 13, 2 Corinthians 9, 8, Philippians 4, 13, and Colossians 1, 29, and other places. And thirdly, we can't think of the work of the Holy Spirit apart from the risen and glorified Jesus Christ. He is the Spirit of Christ, we're told in Romans 8, 9, and the Spirit of Him who raised Christ from the dead in Romans 8, 11. And so now we're ready to talk about the means of sanctification. Murray writes that sanctification is a process that draws within its scope the conscious life of the believer. The sanctified are not passive or quiescent in this process. So sanctification is not something that God does to me, and I'm not even aware of it. You know, it's just kind of unconscious or whatever, and I just, hey, I do what I do, and I go about my life, and God somehow is making me better all the time. No. This is, has to be a very active, conscious process where I am actively recognizing that I'm being led by the Spirit, and I'm cooperating with that and helping. I'm doing my Bible reading every day. I'm praying every day. I'm coming to church. I'm doing my best to be obedient. When I fall down and I sin, I go ask for, God. I go ask for forgiveness from God and from some other person if I sin against that person. And then I move on. I pick myself up and I move on and I, and I do better. It's a process that I'm involved in. It's a very, very active thing, which is why Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Now, why did he say, for it is God who works in you? He's telling you to do something. Why is he saying, for God works in you? Well, I think partly to encourage us. Because if it's God who's working in me, he's going to complete the task, as he said to them, isn't he? It's going to get done. He's going to make it work out. I can make it be easy or hard. You know, you can do this the easy way or you can do this the hard way, right? God comes to me and kind of gives me a little tap on the shoulder and says, no, not that way, this way. And I go ahead and walk off in that way. Well, he may come along with a two by four the next time and you'll whap. No, I said that way. Yeah. So we can make it easier on ourselves, but God will accomplish it. If we have been born again, God's going to accomplish it. So cooperate. Commenting on this passage in Philippians 2, Murray writes, the salvation referred to here is not the salvation already in possession, but the eschatological salvation, the salvation having to do with our ultimate destiny. All right, so there is a sense in which we are already saved, as we've said before, and we are being saved, and we will be saved. Clearly in this case, when he says, work out your salvation, with fear and trembling, he's not talking about the fact that I've already been saved. I can't work that out. So we can't work out our election or our regeneration or justification or adoption, but we must be changed and work out our faith. We must have a real personal righteousness as well as the imputed righteousness of Christ. So this whole modern idea in the church today, which is so prevalent, that I can be saved and it's only... I know it because I know in my heart I love Jesus, but my life's a mess. That's just not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches a salvation that's a real change in me. God has worked a change in my heart. And because of that change in my heart, I'm going to cooperate and live a different life. Now again, yes, we all fall down. Yes, we all sin. Yes, Christians can even commit gross, heinous sin. And God will deal with them. 
but that we have to have in our heads that that's not the goal. We shouldn't be thinking, well, it doesn't matter. I've been saved. I can just do what I want. No. If, if you're saying that, you're not a Christian. You should want to please your Father in heaven. You should want to do what is right, and you should be doing it to a greater and greater degree. So what's the application? Well, are you functioning as a proper part of the body of Christ? It's not just you. It's not your little personal relationship with Jesus. It's are you a part of the body of Christ? Do you have a real love for your brothers and sisters? And again, none of us do this perfectly. We're all selfish in our hearts in the core of our being, but do you have a love for your brothers and sisters? Do you want to see your brothers and sisters moving along in Christ also? Do you rejoice when your brother gets the promotion and you just didn't get one? Do you grieve when your brother gets ill and you're feeling fine? Do you help? Do you do what you can? Are you a part of the body of Christ? And read Ephesians carefully and meditate on the communal nature of the church and identify, verify, cultivate, and use your gifts for the good of the body of Christ. Everybody has a gift. Not everybody's called to be a pastor, not everybody's called to be a teacher, but everybody has a gift, and we're all to use them. In Romans 12, in the ESV, it says, we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another, having gifts, that's a statement of fact, having gifts, that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. And that's what we need to be doing. And for next time, you should read chapter 8, which is on perseverance of the saints. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the church. Lord, we thank you that you are building your church and that you use us, Lord, imperfect, sinful human beings that you have saved by grace and in whom your Holy Spirit is working to bring us to glory. Lord, we pray that you would help each one of us to do our part in the body of Christ, Lord, that we would look for our gifts, that we would cultivate these gifts, that we would use these gifts, and that we would learn more and more how to love each other as you loved us, that your church may grow and prosper and glorify your most blessed name. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.